Welcome to this week's Who the Folk podcast. I'm Lonnie Goldsmith, the editor of TC Jew Folk. This week, I talked to Jennifer Glickstein, an entrepreneur, occupational therapist, and founder of Dress Up to Calm Down. We talk about how she started her company, some of the science behind weighted clothing, and her work with PJ Library Minneapolis on this week's Who the Folk podcast. But before we get started, be sure to check out some of the other podcasts that Jew Folk produces, like The Jews Are Tired, where Lev Gringos is taking a deep dive into Jewish news, Kumba Hineni, Jew Folk's podcast on intersectionality with your host, Enzi Tanner. And if you're looking for a weekly dose of Jewish pop culture, check out The Bagel Report, produced by Jew Folk in partnership with Jay, the Jewish News of Northern California. Go to tcjewfolk.com slash podcast to learn more. Jennifer Glickstein, welcome to the Who the Folk podcast. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. I'm honored to be here. I'm very excited to talk to you. So you are, among other things, uh, entrepreneur, uh, businesswoman. You are the founder of the company Dress Up to Calm Down. And I guess, you know, before we jump into some of the other things that you do, tell me a little bit about this company and where, where it came from? Sure. So, um, we started this company, um, mainly me, but my husband helps a little bit too on the side, um, in August of 2021, um, right around the time, uh, that that we were in the heart of the pandemic and there was just a lot going on, um, with kids, um, with sensory issues and anxiety. And, um, a little bit about me, I'm a pediatric occupational therapist. Um, and I work at a company called Kids Abilities um, in Shoreview. And when I was working there, um, I was working with this little boy who had ADHD sensory issues. He was kind of just um, a little um, messy. And so we uh, really like to use weight um, in therapy as a tool to help kids calm down um, and help them focus and listen and things like that. And so um, currently the weighted tools that we use in the therapy world are very ugly and boring. (laughs) Uh, They're super outdated. So like you'll, you, if you go and um, if anyone's in therapy, the therapy world, you go and you see one and it's this denim vest or this, you know, ugly velvety thing. And kids just don't like them because they're so unappealing. (laughs) Um, And so This little boy like refused to put it on, even though I knew it would help him, um, you know, be able to do more in our sessions. And what ended up happening was he loved superheroes. So I was like, oh, maybe if I like put a Superman logo on the front and a cape on the back, like he would maybe wear this tool um, because it's motivating. And so that's kind of what I did. And, um, you know, I put some arm weights and leg weights and um, he put it on immediately. He was super excited and um, he wore it and like just transformed into this different kid. And so um, I kind of, you know, did my research and I was like, there's something here, like this is really special. And um, that's kind of where Dress Up to Calm Down was born. Um, So we specialize right now in uh, weighted costumes and then um, are hopefully looking at expanding into uh, more discreet clothes for school um, and out in the community for kids. So that's really neat. Can you like I understand I've heard of uh, weighted blankets like that. Yes. That feels extremely common. Uh, have at least one somewhere in our house. <laughs> but what's the science behind that? Why? Why is using weights in that way beneficial and it helps the the child in this case be able to sort of interact and you know work within you know whether it's school or whatever they're doing better yeah so um first and foremost let's kind of take you back to um you know first grade knowledge where we've all learned that you know we have five senses right yep smell taste touch feel um and sight so a lot of people don't know, but we actually also have three other senses as well, and they don't get talked about, um, and they're kind of unknown to the world. Um, and so those are our interoceptive system, which makes us 
it's the feeling when we have to go to the bathroom or when we're hungry. Um, there's the vestibular system, which is our in, in our inner ear, and that helps us with our balance, our coordination. So if you ever get like an ear infection or uh, crystals in your ear, a lot of vertigo, mm-hmm. um, that's that vestibular system that's affected. Um, and then there's the system called our proprioceptive system, um, which is um, helps us w- know where our body is in space. And the weight um, that we use actually impacts our proprioceptive system. So weight, um, it provides uh, what we call deep pressure input. And so when it's applied, um, it actually puts our body into what we call that rest or digest mode of our parasympathetic nervous system. I mean, it helps slow our heartbeat and slow our breathing um, and helps kind of just naturally calm us down. Um, And so um, another benefit of weight is that it actually helps tell our body where we are. Um, So for many of these kids who have um, difficulty with proprioceptive input, um, the weight tells them like, I'm here, I'm safe. Like this is where my body is, um, which is really hard for many of them. So I don't know if you've seen a child, but who like walks down the hallways and has to like touch everything or is like constantly tripping over their feet. (laughs) Um, Those are the types of kids that maybe aren't registering that proprioception. And so that's where that weight would help kind of tell their body, like, I'm here. Like, this is where I am without having to like touch everything to know where they are. Fascinating. (laughs) That's really interesting. I, I, no, no clue that that was how the the body worked in that way. It's very complex. <laughs> um, sensory is one of those things that I feel like it just hasn't really been talked about, and it's starting to gain traction. I think over the last couple of years, um, especially after the pandemic, when parents are starting to realize like something's not right with my child, you know, with at home learning, or they need more support, or they need more things. Um, So they were able to see a lot of those uh, kind of behaviors come up. Really interesting. So are you still, you're still working at Kids Abilities? So um, I work one day a week there. Um, I'm actually in a fellowship program right now um, called uh, Finnovation Lab. Um, And they picked uh, nine companies that have a social enterprise mission, um, and they basically are funding our startup, um, and we take business classes, and we learn how to um, run a company. And so um, I'm doing that full time <laughs> while doing my business, and uh, well, yeah, just kind of busy. <laughs> well, and I was going to mention, so I was going to mention the fill- the fellowship. It's through uh, Finnegan's. Yes. Uh, brewery. Mm-hmm. Um, how did that, how did this opportunity come about? Cause this isn't really, this isn't a new thing. This fellowship, this is in there. This is the fifth cohort it's fifth of cohort. the program yeah. they've run. So how did you get connected with that? Um, so I actually, um, I'm, I did another like accelerator program, um, right at the beginning of when I started called ILT Academy. Okay. Um, and, it was all virtual at the time, but they actually just partnered with Finnegan's um, and the Finn Lab um, to do things for the like another fellowship type program. Um, but I through that I um, learned about Beta, which is another accelerated program, <laughs> um, and I um, applied to showcase a booth at one of their events. Um, and through that showcasing, I met the CEO of uh, Finnegan or Finnovation Lab. Her name's Connie. Um, And she kind of told me about the program and thought that I would be a really good fit and kind of loved my impact and mission um, and told me to apply. So it's kind of how I (laughs) connections. (laughs) Listen, if the CEO tells you you should apply, you probably should apply. (laughs) Like, I feel like in the startup community, it's all about connections. Oh, absolutely. (laughs) Everybody's connected to everybody. So it's, it's kind of fun. So going through, you know, through school and through, you know, your work as, as an OT, did becoming an entrepreneur and being part of all of these sort of startup accelerator labs, did you ever envision that was something you were going to transition into? Um, 
I don't, I guess I never thought I'd be an entrepreneur necessarily. Um, <laughs> I have zero business experience whatsoever, um, but my <laughs> husband has his own company. So I like, you know, see him doing it and going through it. Um, my family owns a four generation company, you know, um, so it's kind of like in my blood, I guess. <laughs> um, but, um, the cool thing about OT is you have to be very creative. Um, it's in, our, you know, it's the best part of the job, but you can't just like go in without a plan. Like you have to think on your toes and things constantly change. And so you have to really, um, yeah, get get creative. And I think that's the biggest thing I've brought into this like entrepreneurial journey is like my ability to like think critically and, you know, be creative and try new things um, that maybe are out of the norm. Um, and so I, I definitely think that being an OT has helped me to be an entrepreneur <laughs> in like an indirect way. Um, so, but yeah, I never really thought that I would, you know, own a company. It's, it's crazy. <laughs> That's, and it's great. It's a great company. And again, the social, you know, the sort of the social driven mission side of it is obviously really important. And it's something that I think, um, like you explained the science earlier, it just sort of makes sense of why it's uh, a needed uh, outlet for some families. Yeah. I, what I like to think about, you know, is like, it's the costumes um, are great, you know, for the in-clinic stuff and for kids to use at home too. But really, um, I think this new line of clothes that I'm going to be coming out with um, is really just going to take off and families are, you know, I think a lot of families don't even know that they're going to need it, you know? So it's a lot of <laughs> education um, and things like that too, that uh, really getting parents to learn about it, learn the science. Cause like I said, it's, it's really unknown, um, yeah. you know, unless you're in the therapy world um, with your child. So. So how did the, like with a blanket, I guess it sort of makes sense intuitively. It's just the blanket where it's quilted They're you know, little bit of weight distributed throughout do, do the clothes sort of work in the same way how do you how, how does the construction of funny so I'll, I'll, I'll take you back but the funny story about a blank the blankets is that a, a couple years ago um, some guy who made these blankets was like made so they used to be used in therapy but now <laughs> um you know he made them a non-therapeutic product and they just have like taken off right like you couldn't you couldn't find them. I was gonna say now Target's selling them and they're in mass retail and yeah. um you know they're like everybody owns one like it's it's kind of just insane. But um the thing with the blankets is they really do help ki you know kids and adults sleep better. Um but you can't really move in them right. You, they're clunky and they're hard to wash and <laughs> um and so you know I think the um with the clothing that we're doing um. You can wear them. You can, you know, take the weights out. You can um, wash them. It can be worn as a regular article of clothing. Um, the weight that, to answer your question, the weight um, is distributed in the abdomen, um, okay. 360 degrees. And so um, it, it gives that pressure there, which is the, one of the biggest surface areas. Um, and so, and the, the coolest thing is like, you would never, ever know that it's a weighted item. It is so discreet that like kids put it on and it just looks like, like a hoodie, <laughs> um, which is, I think is so cool. Um, so when kids are ready, look different, um, you know, with their anxiety or their sensory um, and feel different, they can wear this item and, you know, nothing changes. They don't stand out. They don't, you know, have more anxiety because they are wearing something that, you know, other kids can see so yeah <laughs> that's that's really that's really cool so it's the there's the costumes i know there's a stuffed animal on the website also yeah with that um we are currently testing prototypes um but they will be able to be heated um to add extra calming and then i am looking into writing a children's book uh actually along with it um and so the weighted stuffed animal would be in the book okay teaching kids to calm um through a book in a fun exciting way too so so you have an almost two-year-old you are about 
to give birth to your second child. You've started a new business in the last in the last year and a half ish, and you are writing a children's book also. Yes, and coming out with a whole new line of clothing within that business. Yep, <laughs> some might say I am insane, but uh, it keeps me it keeps me busy. And <laughs> I would say ambitious. I don't mean to <laughs> insane, but like that's I mean, it's a lot. It's definitely a lot to try and take on right now. It is. Um, but I am definitely a go-getter. Um, and I'm, I'm really passionate about this company. Um, you know, again, it's, for me, it's about helping these kids that are underserved. Um, and I just love what I do and I know it works and I have had great feedback from, um, a lot of my families that I work with, um, you know, it's it's just something so special to me, and you know, it keeps me going every day. So, I I can certainly see like the clinical use, especially for the costume one. But do people get a lot of use out of it at home as well? Um, so the the costumes are kind of just a, a fun a fun way to wear weight. So it's essentially like having a weighted blanket, but like kids love to dress up, and so for a lot of parents, it's just something, you know, that it's easy to get them to use. Um, a, a lot of times um, kids with sensory issues um, start to escalate and you can kind of see depending on what the situation is, but um, they start to escalate and, you know, start to have these moments where their bodies need, you can tell that they need something to help them calm so they don't melt down or shut down. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of times it's hard for parents to get kids to use um, some of the tools that they learn about in therapy um, be- because, like, why would they? <laughs> but if it's fun and exciting um, to them, th- they're more likely to, you know, to use it. Um, and so that's kind of where the costumes come in for, like, the kids at home is, like, the parents see, like, oh, something's triggering them. Like, let's try, you know, let's wear a costume or let's put this on. Um, and then it helps them calm before, you know, they aren't able to do whatever they're, whatever's causing that trigger. Got it. So in addition to all of the other things that you're doing, and like we said, there are plenty of them, you're also <laughs> doing some work with PJ Library in Minneapolis. I am. <laughs> yes. Which is, which is to shout out my friend, Amy Weiss, how I had initially heard about you. Yes. Um, tell me about what you're doing with PJ Minneapolis. So PJ Minneapolis, um, I um, just joined, obviously, when my son was born and didn't really know about it. I'm uh, born and raised in St. Paul, so we didn't really have um, that program like when I was growing up. Like, I've never heard of it. But one of my friends was a a connector, and she kind of told me about it and encouraged me to go to these events. Um, And so, and then she ended up having another baby and kind of like you know, told me that I'd be a great fit for this position. And um, so I, you know, interviewed and I took it and um, I'm one of the uh, parent connectors. Um, And my role is really to connect young, new families, um, you know, together to build community, to have these events for babies and and kids um, to come and, you know, learn about Judaism and learn about their, um, heritage. And then also like the books, like we get a book every month, um, related to the holiday that's coming up. Um, and so it's been just an incredible experience to meet new people, connect people. Um, I absolutely, that's another thing I love to do. (laughs) I'm a very people person. So, um, you know, building friendships, building connections. Um, and we just recently, reformed the structure of PJ. So um, I will be doing the zero to two uh, kids and um, Terry, who's my co-connector, will be doing the three to five. Um, So we expanded because many families have told us that, you know, they want more for their older kids. Sure. We just, yeah, literally within the last month, (laughs) I'm added a three to five um, parent connector, like role. So more kids could um, you know, learn and do things, um, in the Jewish community. So how do you have the time for all of it? Like (laughs) I I struggle with the one job and my kids are 18 and almost 14. Right. And it still feels hard. How do you, how do you do this all? (laughs) 
Um, I'm a very good prioritizer. Okay. <laughs> um, I have a great support system. Um, my husband's fantastic. My family lives in the city, so they help when they can. Um, you know, you just gotta do it. <laughs> <laughs> Some days are hard. Um, sure. But um, like I said, when you love to do what you do, it just you make the time. <laughs> I guess that's true. <laughs> you know, um, yeah, it's never been like a a chore for me to have to do anything that I do. Like I, I I love my OT job. I love this business. I love PJ. It's just everything I do, I, you know, give 100 percent And um, you know, I just feel like it inspires me and like I wake up feeling recharged every day minus right now because I'm two weeks out from this baby. But <laughs> and, and by the time people listen to this, you you may well have had, you probably will have had the baby. Already, I will have so. Had, yeah. <laughs> so I'm a little t- dragging these days, but you know, still, still trying my best at everything. Um, it seems totally reasonable to be dragging at this point. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's hard, especially with a toddler too. You know, oh, the yeah. first time wasn't as bad, but this time it's like, okay, I'm, I'm feeling it. <laughs> yeah, no, I understandable. You know, I think it's really interesting is that sort of the th- through line through all of the different things is working with and helping families. Yes. Absolutely. In some way or another, like that sort of, they're different things all, but that's kind of the the connector of all of them. Overarching theme of my life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I uh, very, I, I just, I knew like from a young age that like I wanted to do a profession where I was helping people. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I've worked with mainly with the special needs population for majority of my life, but um, also really, again, like, yeah, just building, building connections and, um, making sure that these underserved, un- underrepresented populations are getting the help and access that they need, um, I think is really my drive. <laughs> Where do you think that comes from? Was it something in, in your upbringing, something somewhere else, or just what you've found your passion to be along the way? Yeah. Um, I think I just, I, I, I come from a very loving, uh, family, very close family. Um, you know, uh, I just feel like the connection of that support is so invaluable. Um, and I think just that alone has kind of made me more just like a soft, warm hearted, like person. (laughs) Um, and you know, just through various experiences I've had, um, you know, in college, I volunteered with Special Olympics, um, and I interned and I just, I love like just, yeah, giving back and helping people. Um, and then through that, I, I knew I wanted to do more specialized work. So that's kind of where I went to OT school, um, and then got an OT job. Uh, but kids have really always been my, my love. Um, you can really see such impact and change in a child, um, you know, from when they're born to like tech, I mean, until they go to college, there's such change um, and in development that you can really see an impact. Um, and so I think that's just where I kind of fell in love with like the progress, you know, mm-hmm. watching the progress and making a difference. Well, that's fantastic. Well, Jenny, last couple of questions, and we will let you get back to one of the myriad of things <laughs> that you have to work on before uh, yes. baby number two is born. Uh, first, what is your favorite Jewish holiday? Ooh, that's tough. Um, I think I love Shabbat. I know it's not like a, a holiday holiday, but um. I just love that it happens every week and I grew up celebrating, um, you know, every Friday night alternating between grandparent houses. Um, and now we do our own Shabbat. Uh, and I just love that. It's like a time to, at the end of the week to just decompress and, um, be together. And like, there's just nothing, I don't know. It's just amazing. Like, I just love Shabbat. (laughs) And and with all of the things that you're doing, finding that sort of mandated time to decompress is probably a good thing. 
It is. <laughs> <laughs> and my son loves challah. It's just fun. Like, and now he's starting to learn about it at school. And, you know, um, so it's been, it's been super fun. And we do things with friends and family. And again, that connectedness, I think Shabbat's a great time to, you know, be together with people Absolutely. and it happens every week. <laughs> Absolutely. And what is your favorite Jewish food? Ooh, probably kugel. I'm a big kugel girl. <laughs> Is there one in particular or a style in particular? Because obviously, Kugel, there's a lot of different ways it can go. Uh, I would say the sweet uh, noodle Kugel with the like corn flake, cinnamon sugar streusel topping. Yep. So definitely a fave. And then I am a soup girl. So like matzo ball soup is just like my my go to. So. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, well, Jenny Glickstein, thank you so much for the time. I really appreciate it. It was great talking to you about all of the things you are doing and working on and a preemptive mazel tov on uh, the birth of your uh, second child. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. You're very welcome. The Who the Folk podcast is part of the Jew Folk Podcast Network, a product of Jew Folk Inc., Please subscribe, rate, and review the show wherever you get your podcasts. If you have suggestions for other podcast guests, please email them to me at editor at tcjewfolk.com. For our other shows, check out tcjewfolk.com slash podcast.